I'm Sheila Shockey. Welcome everyone to Think and Drink Like a Futurist. Hope you all have your Tom Collins ready to go. Okay. We're going to add it. Gabby, does it look like we have most everybody in? Give me the thumbs up if it does. I think it so. It's okay, slow. great. All right. Well, welcome everyone to Shockey Consulting's monthly Think and Drink Like a Futurist. I'm your host, Sheila Shockey. And a few years back, I started studying futurology. It's a little bit like meteorology because, but the, the good thing is, is you're not really around in the future, maybe potentially like meteorologists are when they miss the mark. But um, this was a perfect uh, uh, interest for me because as uh, I love to imagine positive change through the lens of a scientific and historical understanding of the world. So that, that's what th uh, the think part of this program is. And as a bud budding futurologist, I was captivated by a group of visionaries in the early 20th century. And they predicted that we would have to, um, most of the things that are happening today, which was fascinating back in the day. And uh, one of the things they did um, predict was this worldwide pandemic. And that's where the drink came in. During the pandemic lockdown, thinking about the future, I thought, hmm, I really need a cocktail. And that's how Think and Drink was born. So with that, let's start with our drink recipe from our resident mixologist, Tyler Waldorf. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, Tyler Waldorf. Um, show of hands, who's glad that it's Friday afternoon? I know I am. <laughs> okay, good, got some takers. So today um, I chose a Tom Collins. It seemed uh, refreshing, uh, especially after perhaps heavy holiday season. So I thought something a little more light and refreshing would be a good way to start off the new year. Um, and uh, especially on a cold day here in Kansas City, I thought it sounded pretty good. So Tom Collins today. Um, and so uh, classic cocktail, uh, you're gonna do two parts gin. Um, I prefer Bombay Sapphire, uh, my own preference, but there's a lot of, lot of good options out there. Um, and then uh, one part, fresh squeezed lemon juice for a little tart tang. And then uh, one part simple syrup or less if you don't prefer a sweet drink. And then you top the rest off with uh, club soda or any other sort of bubbly of your choice. And because it's Friday and for a little flair, which we appreciate here at Shockey, uh, a lemon wedge to uh, garnish. So uh, hopefully everybody has something to uh, enjoy during the presentation, uh, but cheers to you all and a shout out to Betty White and what would have been her hundreds this week. So <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Cheers to Betty. Well, our topic today is the electrification of everything. And coincidentally, last night, um, I was reading about this topic and was really getting into this book I was reading, and the power went off in downtown Overland Park. And so I'd like to shout out to Kurt Skoog, our current mayor, for I, I'm sure that he's the reason we got our power back up. So thank you so much, Kurt, for um, doing that. Um, we have three panelists today to discuss how the electrification of everything may impact your work and your everyday life. But first, let's look at some signals about this topic. The Think and Drink series follows the work of um, Jeff Desjardins, the founder and editor of uh, vir Virtual Cap Visual Capitalists. And if you haven't uh, looked at their works, they basically use infographics to describe very complex and um, interesting worldwide topics. And our series uses this uh, book as a framework for the Think and Drink um, discussions. And I believe we've been doing this about a year now, and we're up to um, the environmental signals that um, we're looking at kind of uh, holistically. And electrification is this week's, um, this week's conversation or this month's conversation. 
And so what signals are is basically a way to look at data and really think about how strong is that signal and, and piece of data or um, basically the co uh, conglomerate of data around this topic. And then how might that apply to um, your work uh, at, as a local government or state government or your everyday life. And so um, these signals really do help us to better understand what potentially could happen in the future. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go through um, a few pages of his book. Um, his book's available uh, on Amazon. We also do send the link um, available as well. And um, uh, I think this is just kind of a good introduction to kind of get our uh, mindset for our great panelists and discussion that we have today. And so bear with me a minute while I find that. And here we go. Tyler tells me control L will work. So let's try that. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Give me the thumbs up, Katie, if you can. All right, great. So again, this is um, the book, uh, Jeff Desjardins. He's with the Visual Capitalist. He's the founder and executive in chief. And he has this book called Charting the New Direction of the Global Economy. Um, he's got a second book out that um, will be uh, promoting and kind of, um, we're not actually, we're not his PR rep or anything like that, just so y'all know. We just, I uh, really do it, just enjoy um, this. And I, I really do use his uh, material to kind of frame some of the work that we do with local governments. And so the electrification of everything is what we're talking about today. It's signal eight within the um, environmental section of the book. And the electrification of everything, um, this graph here shows US projected electricity consumption. It has historical from 1950 and then has projected modeled um, electrical demand um, in uh, up to 2050. And I think it's an interesting um, graphic because it shows that really um, primarily industrial, residential and commercial um, use of electricity um, and electrical demand has really grown kind of exponentially over the past um, uh, several, uh, since 1950. And those three sectors will continue to grow, but somewhat flatline. And I would imagine that that has something to do with kind of conservation and um, maybe um, kind of just uh, just different uh, different use of different uh, fuels and that sort of thing. But you look at this one that we're going to talk about today, which is transportation, and you can see that really um, the shift for electrification um, of the transportation sector really is going to impact the demand side of the U.S. energy system. And then we do know that um, changes in terms of fossil fuels, uh, we're going to see probably a decline in fossil fuels due to climate change, and we'll see more of these uh, the chart on the bottom kind of shows globally to 2040 um, what we're going to see as a percent of um, total electricity generation by type. And you'll see um, nuclear, um, hydro, wind, and solar are going to be coming uh, more and more prevalent, um, which is probably not surprising to the majority of you. I think this graph is a great one as well. This graphic, this infographic shows that in the dark areas, this is really the potential for electrification. And it shows that, uh, you know, we're just kind of dipping our toe in the transportation sector in terms of electrification. So non-electricity driven um, items here um, are uh, in black and the green are ones that are already powered by electricity. So you can see that there's a great capacity um, through the electrification of these different sectors, transportation and industrial, to really add to the um, amount of, um, of um, demand for electricity. And it shows at the bottom here, the rising global electricity demand. And you can really see um, a huge potential um, over the next 20 years in terms of electrification of different sectors. And so the electrification will largely impact, as I said, the industrial sector, but there'll be noticeable effects um, seen in transportation buildings and many other aspects of our everyday lives. And so this um, chart over here to the right at the top shows the growth um, potential of electric vehicles in the automobile market. And um, everything that I'm reading is saying that, you know, really our infrastructure probably won't be ready as fast as the, um, the uh, vehicle um, manufacturers will be in terms of electrification of their fleets. 
And where will the electricity come from? As I said, this, these graphics kind of show the um, power generation capacity by different technologies. And you can see um, a great potential there for solar um, and the projected cost of electricity by type. Um, this is a graphic that shows um, Germany in terms of what they're experiencing um, and have been experiencing over the past um, 10 years. And, uh, you know, when you hear of electricity, you always think, oh, green, um, green power, but um, electricity isn't all green yet. Um, the forecast in terms of renewals um, uh, are, are really heavily dependent on whether um, the, the source of energy and those renewable energies can become cheaper than fossil fuels. We know that government intervention will help with that um, investment in innovation and technology, uh, but it really comes down to battery power and battery cost and innovation and battery. So you can generate a lot of um, electricity in terms of uh, these um, non or these renewable sources of um, energy, but if you can't store them in um, battery um, uh, and the cost of that arises, it will make it more difficult to replace that at, uh, fossil fuel signature. So one of the things that we'll be talking about in the future is kind of data, technology, innovation. And this is kind of the, the stepping stone in terms of um, really unimaginable products and transformation of different industries. Uh, we will focus today on um, uh, some of those innovations. I'm really excited to hear our speakers talk about those. But um, really, uh, the electrification and advancements in storage and battery power can really um, transform a lot of the industries that we see in our communities and that drive economic development. And um, absolutely a tool to combat, uh, combat climate change and um, a way to really um, think about how can we move people and goods in a way that has less of an impact on the environment. And rapid technological advances um, in all of these areas will be the key really to what promise um, electrification can hold our world. And so that's just a little bit of an introduction to that topic. Um, uh, again, I'm not uh, getting a kickback on his books, but if you'd like to get one of his books, I would highly recommend it. I think that um, they really um, are great uh, graphics that you can use to describe problems in your community and, and really help people think a little bit more about the future. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists, which we're really excited to have today, Rick Azer. He's an associate vice president at Black and Beach, located here in Overland Park, their headquarters but he's located in San Diego and was just bragging about how nice the weather was there. Um, he's a founder of the company's Growth Accelerator, and that's a team that champions cultural innovation and technological disruptions, which um, Futurology is all about, looking at those disruptions and how they'll impact our economy in our way of life. So um, Rick's going to talk about the electrification of the transportation network, and he works with departments of transportation across the country, and it's been a great joy to just um, learn from him and excited to hear what he can share today. Our second panelist is Susan Friedman. She's a senior planner of clean transportation at Sandag. Am I saying Sandag right? Is that here? Okay, good. And that's the San Diego's region's um, primary public planning, transportation, and research agency. And Susan's going to discuss the area's forward-looking transportation initiatives. And then Katie Ott Zender, she is a vice president of HNTB, also I believe headquartered here in um, uh, Kansas City area. And she leads a team to achieve innovative and complex transportation infrastructure and the modernization, modernization of programs. In the past five years, these programs have focused on smart cities, which we've been hearing a lot about, and I'm excited to learn more about that today, as well as electrification and most recently advanced air mobility, uh, many equity and greenhouse gas goals, and we'll kind of go into the, um, the infrastructure bill and how that might play into all of these, um, these different initiatives going on today. So with that, i um, like to give a cheers to Rick and say, Rick, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sheila. I'm going to see if I can get my um, screen going here. Just give me one second. While I'm doing that, I just want to say thanks, Tyler, for the recipe. Really appreciate it. I um, I ended up using ginger beer for um, for mine just because I couldn't find any club soda around the house. I did find one, but it was like flat, so I went for the ginger beer. 
So I don't know if that's like a different, if that's like a Ginger Collins or. I think it's a Collins. London, London Mule. I London just Mule. that from April today. So I think it might be a London Mule. All right, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, zero emissions transportation. Let me see if I can just get this in slideshow. There, is that showing now? Yeah, it's showing your next slide, but that, that works out pretty well. Okay, I'll just go with, with it this way. Um, so, so again, Rick Azer from Black & Veatch, I work within our strategy and growth group. Uh, you guys local are probably familiar with Black & Veatch. Sometimes I have to explain who we are and what we do, but we are around critical human infrastructure headquartered in Overland Park, Kansas, um, and working everywhere around the nation and around the world. Um, critical human infrastructure is everything to do with power, telecom, water, the, the foundational infrastructure that all of our systems and applications ride across. So I'm going to focus more on uh, decarbonization and, and transportation. These are some of the areas where we as a company are working on transportation and electrification. Um, and it really begins way up front with strategic road mapping and advisory work. We build out networks, both um, for electric vehicles and also uh, recently as well for hydrogen. We're not gonna talk too much about hydrogen today, but there are other alternative um, fuels for that come into play for decarbonization, particularly with respect to heavy duty vehicles, trucks and transportation. We're spending a lot of time now within fleet charging as different businesses and fleets are looking at how do they decarbonize their um, supply chain and transportation is a key element of that. So how are they looking at um, bringing on fleet electrification for their, for their vans, trucks, fleets in general, um, a lot of work around that side that gets into both high power charging and long time dwell, lower power dwell charging. We'll get into a little bit on those differences as, as we go through. And then look into the future around all of this into autonomous vehicles along to um, aviation and marine. All, all of these industries are beginning to look at electrification as a mechanism for decarbonization. So a couple of things that we've done just to give context for our discussion. We've been working on the Tesla supercharger network for a long time now. Um, since around 2013, helping to build sites all over the country, including uh, in the Kansas City metro area. We've also been working with Electrify America. Electrify America is coming from the Volkswagen diesel settlement funds. And is, you know, you can kind of think of it as a high power network for everybody else, for all these new vehicles that are coming to market now, like the Ford Mach-E Mustang and, and others. Um, it's sort of the ubiquitous high power, high power network. On the larger scale, things like bus depots, transit authority, um, um, uh, maintenance stations and, and all of that, we're doing a, quite a bit of work with very high power charging of different kinds of structures. What you see on the bottom right there is a overhead cantilever uh, canopy where a bus can roll in underneath, connect with electricity, very high power very quickly within um, the time it takes for passengers to unload and, and embark on the, on the bus. It has enough power to go its route, you know, maybe another hour's worth of power. So it's a way to distribute power really efficiently to um, uh, transit type of applications. On the left there, this is a, a program that we did with Daimler, the, the truck company, and Portland General Electric up in the Portland area to really look at the various kinds of charging infrastructure, the different capacities, how batteries uh, work in concert with charging infrastructure to reduce demand charges or allow for higher power um, uh, transfer of power with, with low power um, connections. And so, so it's a it's sort of a laboratory or playground of sorts where different kinds of equipment, different kinds of chargers can all inter work within, with each other as this uh, ecosystem develops. A um, couple of things I wanted to go over with respect to the, the, the market size and, and Sheila showed a couple of slides 
you know, how, how large this is and how fast the average cost um, of, uh, uh, is declining for things like batteries, for solar and all of that. And so we're sitting here, I, I know you won't be able to see this, but we are somewhere on the left side of this histogram in 2022 right now, um, which is relatively near zero. So an important thing to recognize is everything we've done so far is just a fraction of what's to come. If you look through into, uh, you know, from today into um, the 2030, 2040 timeframe. And there's a trillion dollars of investment that will be spent on electrifying ground transportation over that time. If you look at the chart on the bottom, you can see nearly half of that is on freight electrification alone on, on, on uh, the large scale trucks and all of that going across our highways and, and that creates an enormous amount of um, potential for decarbonization and, and also for um, infrastructure construction. And one of the reasons buses are, are, sorry, trucks are so important, this chart here shows average annual vehicle miles driven. That top line there is for class eight trucks. So class eight trucks operate almost 70,000 miles per year per vehicle. And so looking at what, how to um, um, enable truck electrification and sort of that transformation of that um, industry area to electric is um, will, ha will have huge benefits to, to um, decarbonization. Right behind it is transit buses and they operate on general about 35,000 miles a year. And we've been looking at sort of total cost of ownership. We did a study on the transit bus market and, and already, in fact, a few years back, there's cost parity over the life of the vehicles for electric over conventional fuels. And so it, it already makes sense to begin to transition bus fleets from uh, conventional fuels to electric. And we're seeing a lot of work in that space. And not to belittle the others as well, because there's fewer trucks than there are personal cars. And even though personal cars go on average roughly 10, 11,000 miles per year, there's zillions of them. So have a big effect by um, converting more and more of them to electrification over time. Um, this is all creating a step change in charging infrastructure requirements. And Sheila mentioned, you know, the amount of infrastructure that will need to be put in place. We, we've been hearing about the infrastructure bill as well of, of the billions of dollars that will be uh, dedicated towards charging infrastructure. These are some of the areas where you'll see that transpire. So high power corridor charging, like what I showed with Electrify America and, and, and Tesla, um, high utilization vehicles like the class eight trucks and the, and the transit buses. And then where this all sort of will, will happen and take place, it's, it's quite a combination of urban areas, you know, in your downtown cores and, and your regions. Susan's gonna kind of show what's going on here in San Diego. And then also just, just all the intercities between that, that need to be um, enabled in order to make electric transportation ubiquitous. Um, just for comparison purposes, just this is a really easy chart. Um, basically, every truck on the road that's driving those um, 80,000 miles a year, each truck is equivalent to about 22 houses of power. Um, and you can see on the left there, um, an enormous amount of kilowatt hours per year that will be converting from gas fuels to electric for each truck that, um, that becomes electric. And so that creates a, a big use of big need for enhanced electric infrastructure all the way from the production, distribution, transmission, and, and at the site level itself. Um, Sheila, you also mentioned about um, instrumentation and data. And, and so part of this too is more efficient use of power so that you know, through, through data analytics and through smart intelligent infrastructure, the efficiency of electrons used is greater. So while a tremendous amount of infrastructure needs to be built, it's not really a straight line. And that's why you see in some of those charts, even though the amount of power will roughly double uh, being used in the US to accommodate the electrification of transportation, it won't result in that, 
that same doubling of infrastructure requirements because the, the level of efficiency will grow. We can get into that maybe in discussion a little bit later. Um, so I'm just gonna close here. The, the other thing to keep in mind is these grid connections take a long time depending upon the size of the needs. Um, working with the utilities is something we spend a lot of time with understanding and helping our clients understand the, the timing requirements given the different kinds of grid upgrades required and the capacity required for different kinds of charging configurations. So as you go to large scale sites with um, fast charging for trucks, you may need a whole sub new substation or major substation upgrade to create the amount of power that's required to go to that facility that has a long lead time associated with it. Um, so this transformation isn't just electric alone. It's connected, you know, almost every vehicle, new vehicle today has the ability to, um, you know, some level of autonomy on their own of, of, of uh, lane keep or cameras or LIDAR or awareness of what's happening around it. Ultimately, things move to autonomous um, and, and definitely towards shared vehicle transport to uh, get the uh, vehicle miles traveled per vehicle or per person per vehicle down as another way of handling carbon, lowering carbon emissions. With the grid evolving towards solar and to wind, the renewable energy component going into clean transportation is growing as well. And that's a key part of this whole equation is to make sure that the power going into the vehicles is clean um, to, to, to recognize the full value of decarbonization. Um, lastly, just a couple resources. These are different um, trade associations that Black & Beach is members of, and, and they've got lots of great information. So if you're really interested in this, um, this area and this field, these may be some organizations to, um, to, to look at. In, in particular, Forth, based in uh, Portland, Oregon, is um, all about electric mobility. Um, and really, really interesting organization to check out. And lastly, we've put together a ton of interesting publications around this as well. So um, all of these eBooks are available for download from our, our website, they're all free. Um, although I think we capture your email when you sign up to, to, to retrieve them. So nothing's really completely free, but there's no, no cost to you for these if you want um, more information, this is another great place to go. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Katie, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about electrification. Thanks. Over to you, Katie. Thanks, Rick. Let's get the right screen here. There we go. Okay, let me try this again. Are you guys seeing the right, you guys see the workforce slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, cool. Awesome. Well, I thought I'd start with um, workforce just because I was just listening to a press conference for a new Intel facility in central Ohio. Um, I've heard we have a little bit of a chips shortage <laughs> around the country right now or the world. So um, hopefully that'll help things. But um, when I'm going to talk a little bit about Smart Columbus, so this was a project in Central Ohio that they they won a grant, like a fifty million dollars fifty million dollars worth of grants, um, forty million from USDOT and ten million from a private funder, Paul G. and Allen Philanthropies, and did like a whole like a ton of different electrification projects, some policies, some incentive programs, uh, you know, installing charging a lot on adoption and there's reports online and um, there's a really cool playbook that's got like a lot of lessons learned if you're from a municipality and want to um, get some tips there but one of the things that happened during the course of that was there was a focus on training and workforce development so increased participation in good um, in good jobs is really a focus of now these federal grants as well so I thought it was um, important to note that 
as part of this, the city of Columbus partnered with Columbus State Community College and they developed and implemented several in-depth technical automotive training classes. And so they started in 2018. This may be happening in areas where you guys live too. I'm sure it's probably farther ahead out in California, but um, the classes were offered to the public fleet um, managers and staff, and they're continuing to do this. And then also on the connected vehicle side, um, they recruited and paid 20 people $12 an hour to do 200 hours worth of training. And so that there was an overlap between the workforce element and then underserved areas. So they got a lot of people from underserved, economically disadvantaged um, areas of the region and put them through the training. And then within their neighborhoods, they worked at these auto shops and installed these high tech devices. And it was um, really exciting because Initially, we were worried that adoption of these devices, everybody would be worried about Big Brother, but it turned out that they became real champions and they were saying like, if you're gonna do this, you need to do it in our neighborhood first. So it worked out really well. Um, so that was just a fun story. And then Rick talked, my slides are a little bit all over the place. I'm just hitting on a bunch of different topics, but we did a medium and heavy duty like strategy um, for the Ohio Department of Transportation a few months back. Um, and one of the things we did as part of that, we Black and Beach was on our team and CalStart and some others. And Maureen Marshall from CalStart helped us set up several interviews with fleet owners such as like UPS, FedEx, DHL. So we talked to their global leads for sustainability um, and electrification. Also Bimbo bakeries that I wasn't even familiar with, but basically any type of bread that you buy anywhere is delivered by them, the largest bakery in the world. And then we talked to OEMs like Liner Electric and Volvo and Tesla and others. So the reasons they said that they're um, adopting is the number one was carbon emissions reduction goals and they were coming from the top of their organization but interestingly with like ups and fedex and dhl that have the smaller trucks like rick was saying they already are seeing an economic benefit so they were already saying this is making financial sense for us to do it and we have the cash flow like the free cash to do it and um, reap the benefits later and then they said it was giving them a competitive edge um, and also Initially, the drivers maybe weren't on board, but as soon as any of the drivers, we talked to some of the local um, companies and they said like, as soon as the drivers started using these vehicles, they were totally flipped. And they went in as far as to say that it reduced sick days, which I thought was kind of a bold thing to state, but they said just the clean air and it was less vibration and just a variety of things. So that was pretty impressive. And then I, safety's on here because um, just because of them being electric vehicles, there's a lot of other safety features that are built in with that technology. So that almost comes with the territory. And so we, and then we also have these fleet considerations. I won't go into each of them, but we call them considerations, but they were really like challenges <laughs> that the fleets brought up to us. And so we just kind of went through each one of them and how to address them in this, this study that we worked on. Um, and then here you can see, this is just a call out to, um, if you're at an agency where you're collecting tax revenue based on um, you know, gasoline, like obvious, I'm sure you're looking at <laughs> what's happening with the revenues as there's a shift in, in um, vehicle type which is what we're showing here, like as adoption increases for these different vehicle classes. And this is just for the medium heavy duty, the tax re revenues decrease unless there's um, different policy or different legislation put in place. And then this is just a shout out to say that um, electrification is really the path to the AV future. So AVs, autonomous vehicles are almost all or pretty much all EVs. So by installing charging, you're enabling that, that future as well. 
And then we've got just another thing to think about. We're doing some work for, again, in the state of Ohio, they, um, we have a task order for the state to, with their innovation office, it's called Drive Ohio. And Ohio is just very proud of being the, they call it the birthplace of aviation because the Wright brothers were here, even though they flew their plane in North Carolina first, but they developed it here. So they're really proud of that and want to stay ahead. And um, they're looking at a framework for how to advance advanced air mobility in the future. And that's primarily, all these vehicles are powered by electricity. So you can see on the left side, this is a Kitty Hawk, and this is what they call an S toll. So it's, you basically have C tolls are the ones now like a jetliner. It's like a conventional takeoff, which is like a gradual slope. These S tolls are like, you'd have a runway that's maybe a third of the length or shorter, and they can make really aggressive um, short takeoffs and landings. And then you've got these VTOLs, which are vertical, which are the other two that are shown here. One's like package and one's like you can put a person in there and they just lift directly up. So um, as this glo these global trends towards mobility innovations and electrification and automation converge, um, AAM will benefit from the scale of investment in technology that's driving battery costs down and energy densities up. And then um, here, I've just, this is just like a lot of, there's a lot of things going on related to electrification and some are um, going to become more common and some will probably go by the wayside, but here's another few other topics, hot topics. Um, we've got in-road charging and battery swapping, which can be appropriate in very specific use cases. Um, Again, um, advanced air mobility systems are powered by electricity. And then the use of solar and wind in conjunction with energy storage um, for micro, to power microgrids are often important considerations for resiliency or evacuation planning. And we're working with um, Cap Metro down in Austin, it's just the transit agency is looking into quite a bit of this. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd mention is this transformation. While we're working with Cap Metro, it's um, we're finding, or you know, you know this, but you see it in real time. Like it, it affects every part of the business. So, like with the Smart Columbus job, when we were, um, they did a procurement and they got these autonomous vehicles, and then someone said, "Well, can you?" report on the greenhouse gas emissions because we were tracking a lot of stuff for the electrification grant but not as much for the usdot one so one of the guys on my team i was like hey they want these ghg emissions and he's like i think those things have a tailpipe and i'm like they have a tailpipe so like we went over and rode around and the guy's like oh yeah i fill them up you know every day with gas because it's for the air conditioner and the <laughs> heating and you know, so we didn't, you know, that hadn't been thought about. So there's just all kinds of little things um, that everybody's learning as they go along and thinking through. And that was several years ago. So that wouldn't happen now, probably. But, you know, it happens if you're not aware and you haven't been through all that. Um, also, like staffing um, is a major consideration with, especially like with transit and with other um, fleet operations where you've got really high powered systems like you have to have different certifications to work on that than the traditional um, people that are employed so that's like a consideration the operations are different like the the layout of the facility has to be rethought and um, obviously there's different maintenance processes so with all of these things that we're talking about um, I thought I'd talk or mention a little bit about how we're going to pay for some of this. And you've, I'm sure you're well aware of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, so IIJA, that was signed into law November 15th, a few months ago, and includes $1 trillion, which is a historic funding level for transportation infrastructure. And there's within that, there's over $100 billion in um, competitive grants. So. On this slide, we have the policy priorities that are articulated within this act. 
And for our conversation today, the bottom line is um, here, this climate justice 40 area is most important. So um, for addressing climate change, the statute includes several discretionary programs that are focused on fleet electrification, charging infrastructure deployment, emissions reduction, congestion relief. Um, and then you'll see these call outs to Justice 40, which you may be familiar with. That's another in initiative of the administration right now. And essentially that means that there's a goal of 40% of the overall benefits flowing to disadvantaged communities. And so the bottom line is there will be resources to innovate and prepare systems for the future as part of this. So I just wanted to call that out. So that's it. I will hand it over to Susan. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, I'm just gonna take a second here to share my screen. I think I've got this. Hit the button. Do you guys see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my name's Susan Friedman. I've been working at SANDAG or the San Diego Association of Governments for about 15 years now. Uh, and we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization or MPO for the San Diego region. Uh, so a little different than what you guys are used to, but uh, we're doing a lot in electrification. Uh, so we're the regional planning agency for San Diego. Our members of our board are the 18 cities as well as the county of San Diego. We're about 4,000 square miles in size and we have a little over 3 million people as our population and that's who we serve. So I wanted to bring up our, our new regional transportation plan, which our board of directors adopted last month. And it's called uh, just San Diego for the regional plan. It's something we do every four years. Every major metropolitan area is required to do one every four years. Uh, this is to plan out our transportation network, uh, really, and it enables us to receive state and federal funding into the region for transportation and land use. Our main goals, which are in the, the dark blue, uh, for the plan were to reduce congestion, improve social equity, and meet state and federal mandates, basically to be faster, fairer, and cleaner. And the way we did this, we kind of threw out the old way we were planning. And the way we did this is through what we call five big moves. And I'm gonna start at the top, kind of at the 1 p.m. if this was a clock with complete corridors and just briefly say a few things. But the five big moves, we see these as um, inter-reliant strategies. They work as one and build off each other. And electrification is a theme throughout all of them. So at complete corridors, that's really multimodal highways and major roads. Um, they leverage dynamically, uh, they dynamically manage the system through different travel modes uh, and manage the space. With Transit Leap, what we're thinking of with that is really higher speed and more frequent service, both bus and rail, uh, and really to have an alternative to driving a car. Like if we get the service up, then people have a choice. Uh, and these are supported by mobility hubs. And the network of mobility hubs provide high-speed transit, provide access to the high-speed transit, uh, as well as other multiple options like our flexible fleets. And they support amenities as well, including EV charging, um, package pickup from Amazon and other things. Uh, then with the flexible fleets, these can be a combination of things, our TNCs, um, like your Ubers and Lyfts, as well as micromobility. So that would be neighborhood electric vehicles, uh, e-bikes and scooters. And these are all to kind of provide options for short trips in the community, again, to have a choice other than uh, a personal vehicle. And then all of this is supported by the next operating system or next OS. And that's the brain behind the scenes. So that's the, um, excuse me, <laughs> that's the uh, provide cities and transit agencies with the valuable real-time data uh, to better align our infrastructure and mobility services with the travel demand and behavior that's happening at the time. So in a nutshell, that's our big plan, which was uh, adopted last month. A uh, couple things with this, this is a $160 billion plan uh, and it looks out to, it's a long range plan and it looks out to 2050. Uh, the three areas we really focused on in the plan was mobility as a service, which you've heard from Rick and Katie a little bit about, as well as the vehicle technologies 
and smart cities to enable those technologies and mobility options. So this is a step back. This slide, the next two slides are really from our state air resources board. But the reason why we're looking at electrification through the plan and how we transition our transportation system uh, is because of air quality issues as well as greenhouse gas or climate change issues. So transportation statewide, 45% uh, of our NOx emissions are from tra on-road transportation, statewide 37% of greenhouse gas emissions. For the San Diego region, it's actually closer, it's almost 50% of our emissions uh, of greenhouse gases are from on-road transportation. And that's really because we have a small industrial sector in the region. Uh, but it, it's a huge motivator for the state and then for the region as well. Uh, and we have a lot of mandates and regulations in California as well. Uh, so this is one of the latest ones that came out in late 2020, Governor Newsom uh, created an executive order calling for 100% of new car sales beginning in 2035 to be only zero emission vehicles, uh, as well as a full transition of trucks and buses to zero emission only. Our transit agencies actually through a regulation have to be all electric, could be with hydrogen or battery electric by 2040, and the trucks are on a similar path. So coming back to the San Diego region, um, shout out to Black and Deech because they did the data analysis and produced this report for us. Uh, but we created a regional EV gap analysis that came out last July uh, through a collaboration we have called Accelerate to Zero Emissions. And it really showed we wanted to see where are we at and based on this flurry of new regulations and mandates, where do we need to be in the next 10 years? And so um, this is what we found. I mean, really, we're at about 69,000 electric vehicles today in the region, need to be over 700,000 vehicles in 2030, or we should expect that on our roads. And we need to plan accordingly with infrastructure. So, um, you know, we're ahead of a lot of regions when it comes to the infrastructure we have in the ground now. But that said, that expectation for vehicles, uh, and this came up earlier as well, uh, we need to plan for and get installed a whole lot more. And this isn't something that's just SANDAG, this is public sector, private sector, state, fed, um, it's really all hands on deck. And that's really why we came up with this collaboration called Accelerate to Zero Emissions to produce this document, was that uh, it's with our local utility, San Diego Gas and Electric, our county, our biggest city of San Diego, and our local air district, because we just knew we can't all just be working in our own silos. We need to come together and figure this out. And then in turn, we'll have consistent messaging when we go out to our constituents as well. So this comes out of our adopted regional transportation plan. Uh, this is our support for electric vehicle investments between now and 2050. It's about $2.1 billion, which is um, really exciting, but also very nerve wracking <laughs> for me because I got to figure out how we actually make this happen. Uh, but to jump through a few of these, the, the first two are related to passenger vehicles. So we're going to establish an incentive program for zero emission vehicles for the goal of funding rebates for 100,000 ZEVs in our region before 2035. We're gonna develop the program and focus that on low and moderate income households. We're also gonna look into whether we can do a used car rebate as well. Um, with EV charging stations, I have that on the next slide because that was the one action that came from our previous regional transportation plan. So we actually kicked that off last year. Uh, we also are looking at longer range supporting hydrogen fueling stations uh, in terms of zero emission buses and infrastructure. We're in a support role with that because our two transit operators in the region have already developed what their game plan is for how to transition their entire bus network to zero by 2040. Um, one is going the hydrogen route and one's going the battery electric route. So we're gonna have some really good examples, but uh, we're gonna do our part as the transit planning agency in support of the operators it is really help secure that funding for those agencies. And then with goods movement and vehicles, uh, I'll also speak to that in a minute. We don't have it figured out how we're gonna plan those investments yet, but we did get a grant to um, come up with a blueprint strategy so we can identify what's needed and how to best um, make investments here. 
Uh, it's pretty substantial though. So we've got a lot on our plate. So this is the one program that we initiated in 2020 it launched. Uh, it's called Cali VIP. It's our EV charger rebate program. Uh, this was a partnership with the California Energy Commission that runs regional programs across the state, as well as our local air district. And the Center for Sustainable Energy, our local nonprofit, uh, administers the program. So it's a three-year program, first three years of 30 years. Uh, and in year one, or I'll say on day one when it opened, we received $90 million worth of project applications on opening day for about a $22 million three-year budget. So the latent demand was really there. Um, what we did with the program was uh, it was set up as via a website. Uh, we offered higher incentives for installations in low-income and disadvantaged communities. Uh, we also reserve part of the program budget, 25% for low-income and disadvantaged communities because we wanted to make sure uh, we were addressing equity. We were really pleased to find that so far with our year one uh, applications, 47% of the projects have been in those areas. Uh, we want to continue that. We want to up, you know, increase our focus on equity when we hit phase two of the program. Uh, something else to say here was uh, the technical assistance, Sandag provided this as well, but uh, what I have an EV expert, it's a no cost consultant that was focused on supporting uh, applicants who were in disadvantaged and low income communities if they had questions on the process on you know what could be good charger installation for them. We had this startup prior to our program launch where you could um, enter the rebate program. Also supported workforce training. Uh, and permit streamlining for our local governments. And with this, we were able to leverage about four and a half million dollars of SANDAG funding, get a million and a half dollars from our air district, and then $18 million from the state by combining forces. So this was a big success for us. And with phase two, we wanna try and build those partnerships and continue them. Um, quickly, uh, in order to have these be successful, that was for public workplace, public charging, workplace charging, as well as shared use charging at multi-unit dwellings. Uh, so we also have this grant from Caltrans, our local DO, our state DOT, uh, to do an EV charger management strategy. This really focused to helping public agencies in the region. All of us uh, began putting in chargers back around 2011 because we were first region for the Nissan Leaf. And a lot of those are dead or dying, uh, need to be replaced, but everything happened as a pilot project. So through this grant, we're developing best practices and policies that governments can use to enact internally, including at SANDAG, um, so that we can maintain chargers that are for the public in our public spaces. Uh, we're also gonna be establishing a bench of EV charger um, service providers that any of us can use, transit operators, local governments, uh, the port, the airport and such. Uh, so this is gonna help us keep the chargers that are out there operating and functioning. Another one uh, from the medium duty, heavy duty, both the transit and the goods movement and the regional plan. This is our stepping stone to figuring out how to inform those investments. We received a $200,000 grant from the Energy Commission. It's kicking off. We just got the contract executed last week with the agency. So now we're able to go out to bid for consultants. It'll be a two year project. Uh, and it's going to help us with our port side communities and we border Mexico. So we have a lot of air quality issues also in our border region uh, and a lot of manufacturing facilities in our border region. So we're going to look at different trucking pilots likely to start out with um, before a full program. Also doing a wireless charging pilot. This is we had a request for information go out in the fall uh, to technology providers of dynamic wireless charging. Uh, from that, uh, staff's putting together a white paper that'll be, I think it will be able to be public in another quarter. So I'd say, well, why don't we just say before July? Uh, but what we're trying to do is uh, come up with, uh, from that, share that with some other local partners like utilities, uh, local governments, tribal governments, uh, to see if we can get a team together to then go uh, compete for state and federal funds to pilot a project on a, a real road. So not on a test track. Uh, and then I had mentioned from the slide that said where we're at and where we need to be, this is Accelerate to Zero Emissions. 
Again, the collaboration and with Black and Beach's support, we produced a gap analysis that was released in July. And we just kicked off the development of a regional EV strategy, which is really a ZEV strategy, um, which is gonna be going on for the next 15 months. Uh, and we have a website for that, but it includes, we have a steering committee that has a academia, business trade association, uh, equity organizations, as well as local government and public agencies engaged. Uh, so again, we see Accelerate to Zero kind of as an umbrella for our region to be able to coalesce a lot of ideas and inform the investments that we're all making. So this I'm not gonna go into, you guys can look at this later, but this is basically all the things that Sandag is working on in this next five years uh, in order to meet the actions of our regional plan uh, in terms of ZEV area. But uh, it's exciting times and we're learning a lot as we go and, uh, and we've got some good experiences so far coming out of it. So that's about it from my end, and I can pass it back to the team. Great, thank you to our speakers. I'm gonna kick off our question and answer period with just one kind of broad question, and maybe folks can jump in on that. Um, maybe, and panelists or um, attendees just kind of think about this question, you know, kind of thinking about what you, you gave a great overview of just things that are happening and some of the drivers, but um, maybe some of the challenges, maybe what's the biggest challenge to um, really electrification of the, um, the transportation sector. Um, you know, one I wrote down, will motorcycles still be cool um, when they're electric? What do you all think about that? What are the biggest challenges? I mean, pickups are because farmers are buying pickups that are electric. But what about, you know, what are the biggest challenges? I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly say I don't have a motorcycle, but our California Vehicle Rebate Project does offer rebates for electric motorcycles. And that's been in place for several years now. So there is an uptick, at least here with electric motorcycles being sold. Uh, I can't speak to how great or not great they are because I can't say that about any um, two wheel device. But uh, I'll start with a government one. I'd say that we're focused a lot on permit streamlining and expediting the permitting process for the installation of any and all types of EV chargers. Because that, and in California, we have so much extra regulation. Uh, you know, Electrify America has talked to us about it and Tesla and others, because uh, it can take sometimes two years to get an installation done. And so um, the state of California adopted a bill back in 2016 to streamline permitting called AB 1236. We did some trainings with our local governments then. They've now come up with a new bill um, that was made into law this year, which now sets times like 15 days to get a permit reviewed and approved and or 30 days, you know, it depends on the type of charger. Uh, but that's really not enough. And this happened with the solar industry too. It took forever on permitting to get solved at the local level. So we're actually gonna have a webinar next month um, with state agency support and the Center for Sustainable Energy to refresh our local government permit staff on the rules as well as show, these are the checklists that were created. This is the website kind of access that was created that you can just kind of take and use yourselves. Uh, and then we're also paying for one-on-one -on -one consultations with a permit expert to help out our local governments who are member agencies to help them through the process. We have, um, I think it's five out of 19 are considered permit streamlined right now, like seven are in, are in the throes of it and another group have not even started. So um, I'll stop there. That, that's awesome because when we talk to all those freight providers. And I mean, anytime you talk to, you know, fleets, that's like their biggest challenge is they want to make sure, like if they've got the vehicles there, <laughs> they need to have the charging there. And a lot of times they can't figure out when they can have the charging there because they don't know how the utility coordination is going to go and they don't know how the permitting is going to go. And um, because it's early, like the agencies don't necessarily know either, like it's taking them longer and they just don't even know when they get a submittal, it's like different than normal. It has to go to a lot more people and the review process isn't really established. <laughs> and so that's, uh, I was going to say utility coordination, but it, it's all, all that permitting and it, like all that is, is the biggest challenge. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Those 
those come in play. I, I also think the pace of technolo technological advancement is playing huge in this space too, with the fact that uh, vehicles are coming out with greater and greater capacity to take um, higher power charging or faster fueling, which, you know, to get on par with uh, gas powered vehicles in terms of time frame for, for charging. A lot of uncertainty around what kind of infrastructure to put in place and how much and when, you know, to sort of time it relatively closely with vehicle enablement so that you're not um, investing too early or, or stranding infrastructure. Um, lastly, maybe also the, the, the ecosystem as a whole is still evolving and developing. So really who, and Susan mentioned it, this, you know, the various different groups and agencies and, and commercial entities that are all coming out with charging infrastructure, it's, it's beneficial on one level in the sense that it, it's helping to promote it everywhere. Um, it's also a little bit of paralysis in terms of what kinds of programs are available for, um, uh, for rebates or, or for investment participation and so forth. And so you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get f some of this funded versus just planning it and having it in the ground and, and operational. Um, Cost is still a huge driver in, in most of the renewables. And we see this in solar and battery and everything else. You really have to take the total cost of ownership into effect to understand the, the true value that electrification brings, but it carries with it an upfront investment that's um, in most cases larger than what you have for conventional, um, conventional vehicles and infrastructure. And so, kind of creating that understanding of total cost of ownership so that the analysis between different opportunities becomes um, um, more understandable. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the reasons why infrastructure might lag behind a little bit in terms of manufacturing is that manufacturing tends to go and be driven by California market and regulations a lot of times. So the manufacturers want to build one type of vehicle that fits their requirements. And so they're driven by, you know, the standard in one state where infrastructure doesn't have that um, same driver. So it seems that the manufacturers are really getting out ahead of the infrastructure um, uh, that's available to, to do that. Um, so Carla Dodds from Shockey, she had a question on here that just said, can the planet supply these materials and resources needed to build all these new infrastructure and vehicles and batteries? So kind of thinking about that in terms of kind of the total uh, picture in terms of climate change and um, impact on the environment. So yeah. um, maybe folks could kind of address that a little bit. Yeah, I'll Maybe I'll start and I know that I know that others will have comments as well. Um, so yeah, this is very much a different set of um, constraints around the materials and um, uh, resources that are needed for electric vehicles and for for solar and um, as as well. Um, the the whole energy supply chain is, is really being developed and and again back to my point on technological advancement as as you're finding constraints or 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 elements that are um, either tough to supply or, or tough to manage the supply chain the chemistries are evolving as well we're seeing that in batteries now with a shift towards um, lower amounts of nickel and cobalt and higher amounts of iron to um, to to create chemistries that are more manufacturable. One another thing to look at too is is the total life cycle and the need to look at the second use and the recycling of materials. One of one of the very interesting things about batteries is most of those specialized materials are wholly recyclable and can be re-energized re into new um, uh, new batteries and new new mechanisms, but that whole infrastructure needs to be developed as well. Redwood materials, you know, in California is a good example of really trying to get in front of the recycling stage to ensure that that supply chain has a, has a full circle life cycle associated with it. 
Great, and we've got another comment from Lisa Trees and about that recycling. Um, are we starting to see a meaningful marketplace for recycling of those specialized minerals? And kind of an, another question is, since copper is a non-renewable metal and mining for it creates major pollution, this is where you're kind of getting into your uh, life cycle uh, then, where will America get enough conducting metal to make the transition to electric vehicle transportation? Are there initiatives going on in terms of that with along with that workforce training? I'll, I'll give my colleagues a chance to respond as well, or I can after. I'm forgetting well, um, the name of okay. some of the companies, but yeah, I mean, they're still early on, but there's definitely <laughs> um, companies that are looking at that. You know, one of the senior guys at Tesla started one a few years ago, and um, there's some good um, videos on YouTube if you just, you know, type in recycling and batteries and like they kind of walk you through the whole thing. Yeah. But there's, yeah. This is Lisa. It occurred it's to me. Be a huge, a huge issue in the future. Sorry. Yeah, it Lisa. occurred to me I could actually talk. I, I was like, I'm so used oh, yeah, to you doing can webinars talk. where I'm always putting stuff in the chat. So anyway, sorry. I was I can just talk. Um, you know, I, I have two young daughters and so we have so many toys and they get all these knickknacks from birthday parties and they all have the lithium batteries and you, you can't even open the battery compartment and replace like there's so many lithium batteries, those button batteries. And it's just like, it's, there's not, there's, I don't know, like, it, yeah, it just seems like there's so much potential. We generate a lot of those. I mean, I know they're small, but um, mm -hmm. if you multiply that toward every family who has kids getting all this stuff, like, you know, it'd be great to, to have like a, an easy way to recycle those. And yeah, some way out. to kind of consider the full life of the materials that are going into the, the system in terms of the electrification. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that's I think that's really important, and and also second life use because we're we're talking a lot about recycle, but batteries have a long lifetime, and they have a, a certain everybody's concerned, you know, mostly concerned about range and capacity and so forth. So they have a certain value within vehicles themselves that that offer the range that um, consumers are expecting to be able to drive. When the batteries degrade over time, and they do, you know, they lose a percent or two each year, um, they get down to say 80% or so, they're no longer um, highly coveted for vehicular use because of the lowering of, of range and capacity, but they're still very functional in their existing form. And so not only are there um, advances being made in recycling of materials into new batteries, but also how to use batteries for second purposes and energy storage is a perfect example of that where, where there's um, plenty of space and use of static batteries that don't need to be, you know, move around and provide propulsion, but still have strong amounts of capacity to be reworked into um, large arrays of storage. That has its own complexity associated with it of, of battery, different battery chemistries and different battery states. And so there's companies that we're working with one right now that are looking at how do you test and demonstrate um, the, the, the capacity and life of batteries. So as you, as you pull them together in parallel into larger assemblies, they operate as they're, as they're intended to. But point, main point being there is, is we're very much at the early stage. You know, we're at the 1% or less of where we're heading. And it's important to, um, not just straight line today's problems into what's it going to be like 20 years from now when we have um, 20, 30, 40% penetration of electric vehicles. If we don't do anything, these problems do become enormous and insurmountable. But if we're able to fund the advancement of the um, uh, technologies, one, one, to change chemistries and two, to reuse um, materials and second life, it'll, those, those um, industries will develop as well. So we have another question from Jeff and he's asking somewhat, it kind of connects to this in terms of the current percentage of electrification provides, uh, provided by green energy compared to fossil fuels. And has there been a total system cost for electrification? And just kind of one of the things that we, I think I talked a little bit with Rick about this in, in our area, uh, wind, 
power is a big um, uh, economic generator, one of the top economic um, uh, priorities for the state of Kansas. And one of the things that is keeping it from becoming more of a um, is the technology for batter, battery storage and for, um, you know, for storing the electricity and then also the wheeling up at the cross with transmission lines and kind of infrastructure. But um, so has there been a total systems cost of electrification that you're aware of? And then kind of speak to maybe the, the challenges associated with moving to uh, green en energy versus fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take a first, a first out of that. Um, I, I can't point directly to, to that information to just say, yeah, here it is. I, I know that there's a lot of work going on on this side of things to, again, sort of look at the total societal cost um, um, from, from end to end. The, um, um, where was I going here? The um, look, looking at what's involved in the cost, you know, the development of the cost um, curves down to make these technologies more accessible over time. If you look at what happened with solar and you see like every year they would reforecast the cost per watt of solar and it, it always exceeded expectations on how fast that that was declining, you know, sort of following Moore's law or even, even in, in front of it. In some cases, batteries are having that same trend associated with them. And so again, it's one of these things where we have to forecast the future and forecast the future um, benefits that will come in terms of um, te technological advancement to um, you know, predict the total cost of things as, as they scale. So there, there's a number of different factors that come involved in putting together this comparison. Um, I think if you look today, you could say that you, you know, if, you, if the entire electric system needs to double in capacity in order to handle the, um, the, the load that electrification brings both in transportation and in industrial and residential and you know, all, all, all these areas, there's definitely a cost associated with that um, capacity advancement to consider in play. The other side of things is the regulatory needs to shift um, to um, uh, you know lower emissions and greenhouse gas reduction and so forth that um, carry a certain cost associated with them as well. So there's there's a lot to factor in to put those kinds of um, comparisons together. You know, if, if I could add just kind of a regional government perspective, more on the green energy, not total cost, but um, it makes a difference when it comes to electrification, especially at transportation. We're at about 40% renewable power on our electric grid for the San Diego region. Uh, the state of California requires it to be 100% renewable by 2040, uh, as well as carbon neutral by 2045. I think that's still to be determined how that is figured out for wider than the electric sector, but for everything we do. But so we're kind of planning in that, in that mindset as well. And some of the holdbacks, you know, are dealing with, we need more storage. Uh, we need other things, but, um, but I think the other push that's going to come on the green side of things when it comes to uh, vehicle electrification is we're looking a lot now at, we have depots and whatnot. Do we need microgrids and in these areas like solar and battery storage combined. And it's, it's not just to, one piece is to keep down the cost of electricity because it's pretty expensive in California. But the other piece is we have power shutoffs for wildfire risk. I mean, you've got different risks where you are. We get shut off many times a year for wildfire. And so if that's an evacuation scenario, we can't switch everybody to electric vehicles and then not provide the fuel to get people out. Um, and so I see it's starting to be planned. I know Black and Beach has done a lot with this and, and others, but that's kind of our next phase mindset is how do we plan if we're going for bigger depots of charging and whatnot. Mm -hmm. This is all very fractal yeah. as oh, well. Wow. So if, if you look at things at sort of the local residential level and there, there's a lot um, of press right now about the Ford F-150 Lightning that's coming to market and it's bi-directional capabilities and it, it, it's going to have a 135 kilowatt hour battery 
in it. And that can carry the home load for a couple of days and it's built in, you know, and I know that there needs to be modifications made to, you know, what your charging system at your home to take advantage of it to be considered in play. But point being that there's a whole lot more energy um, uh, customization and util utilization that will be available as we head into the future to, to take into account. And this will then reduce the demand, could reduce the demand load in the evening peak times. You know, so when you come home from work, you can plug in and rather than charging at that point or rather than waiting for the super off peak hours to hit in the middle of the night, you can actually be discharging a little bit of your capacity to reduce the, the grid load. And with um, intelligent infrastructure, all of that can be managed cohesively as well. And these, these are ways that the, let the impact on the electric infrastructure isn't just a straight line manifestation of replacing this kind of vehicle with that. And then what's the, what's the incremental load? And this really gets into how do you build for efficient utilization of energy across the, across the, the network. So that's at the local level. And then, and then these large ener energy storage um, um, aggregated systems to handle, um, you know, the, the, the ability to take that wind power and that's, that's been created and, and use that over a longer duration and solar inter intermittency and so forth. Um, recently, I was just reading about pumped hydro storage and how relevant that can be at, at capacity um, to create these enormous, essentially these enormous water batteries that, that again can provide the shifting of electrical power to different times of the day or, or even seasons. Um, so all, all of that kind of stuff has to be worked into the think, you know, to this long-term thinking of what is the world like in 2040 or 2050? Like, what does that system look like versus today's system? Yeah, a lot different some, probably yeah. than what we can even think about. I have some maps that might explain this too. I don't, um, might share that if you guys, let's see. Here's a, you may have seen this graph before, but this is just showing you that um, the power grid is getting a lot cleaner. So this is um, greenhouse gas emissions have been trending down and then with transportation, they're still rising. Um, and you can see where it's come, the, where the emissions are coming from in the transportation sector. But these maps I find pretty interesting. So there's four of them and it shows you how the grid is getting cleaner. So this one is 2009 and it's just these, it'll be different years. And just like look at one part of the map. I mean, I'm used to looking at Ohio, but like back in, I'm saying 2016, we had 60% coal and we're now at like 40%. Um, as far as what's being burned to generate power. California is, is much cleaner <laughs> than, than you know, where I live. But um, if you are looking at this, so since an electric vehicle has no tailpipe emissions, most EV emissions are determined by what is used to generate the power. So if you have lots of coal, you have um, a lot of emissions. And so this is showing you that in 2009, there was, you would need to um, get 73 miles to the gallon from your combustion engine vehicle in order to be as efficient as an electric vehicle. So then if you go to the next one, it says, okay, by 2016, you would need your gas car to get 96 miles to the gallon. And then, it goes up to 102 by 18. And I think it might drop, it drops down a little bit. You know, there might've some power plant might've come offline or something, but in general, across the country, all these numbers are trending up. And I know last year they, we were talking to people from the utility commission here and they were saying that just almost all of the new power generation is renewable at this point. So anyway, I don't, that sort of speaks to the 
one of those. We questions. have a few minutes left. Let's open it up. Is there, is there anyone else that would like to um, offer some information or ask a question of our panelists? Anything else? Okay, well, I'd like to thank our panelists today. Let's um, give them a salute with their Tom Collins. That mine is gone, by the way. I drank it during the presentations. It was delicious. But thank you so much, panelists. We'll give you a round of applause. And um, I really do appreciate everybody attending today. Um, we're really hoping to be in person next time. So thanks a lot for joining us. Um, Next month, we're going to kick off our discussions of the digital world. So we're moving from environments to the digital world. And our information, our topic is information overload. And so um, that should be interesting. Um, we're going to see you on the third Friday of the month, which is February 18th at uh, 2022 at 3.30 p.m. We're hoping to have the, um, the session in person and online. We always have an online option for anyone who wants to attend across the country. So we would love to have our panelists back to uh, listen in and, and talk about uh, information overload. So look for a recap of our discussion today and a recording of this session um, on our follow-up email that we'll send out. We did have quite a few people that signed up that sign up a lot of times just to receive the recording so they can listen to it at their convenience. And we appreciate their participation in that way as well to keep this information in front of um, local decision makers. So keep up on the latest trends and happenings at our social media account, which is at Hey Shockey. We just changed our social media account, Hey Shockey, and connect with me on LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn forward slash Sheila Shockey to read what I'm reading about the future. So we appreciate everybody's participation today. Um, I heard today that Meatloaf um, passed away, and I'd like to say paradise by the electric dashboard lights. So <laughs> here's the Meatloaf. And um, here's to your hefty until the next think and drink about the future. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Thank you.